Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Maria Ferguson. I'm the curator here at the Roger Tory Peterson Institute, located in Jamestown, New York. I'm joined by Madeline Card, our Learning and Engagement Coordinator. And today we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Jen Lodi Smith for a discussion about the Sparkbird Project. She'll be, jo she'll be joined by artists Caitlin Davis, Jenilyn Spear, and Liz Wahid, who are featured in our current exhibition, Hope is the Thing with Feathers, Contemporary Women Nature Artists in order to learn more about their spark bird experiences and their insights about birding. Dr. Lodi Smith is a professor of psychology and assistant vice president for academic affairs at Canisius College in Buffalo, New York. And she launched the spark bird project to help better understand who birders are and who potential birders may be. So for more information about the spark bird project, you can visit www.sparkbird.org and we will put that in the chat for you. So you can go right there. So a little about the artists who are joining her in conversation today. Jenilyn Spear spent her childhood here in Chautauqua County and currently lives in Memphis, Tennessee. She uses her art to educate and raise awareness about bird conservation with the goal of promoting our biological, cultural, emotional, and spiritual attachment to the natural world. Caitlin Davis is from Williamsville, New York and attends SUNY Fredonia majoring in animation and illustration. Caitlin uses her art and the process behind it to channel her passion and appreciation for nature, specifically birds. Liz Wahid is a certified scientific illustrator who focuses primarily on ornithological illustrations. Her backgrounds in fine art, wildlife conservation, and the care of captive raptors inspire her work. If you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to type them into the chat. And at the end of the talk, Madeline will read your questions to Jen or the artists. And we are recording this talk, so if you would like to watch again at a later date, you can head to our YouTube channel, um, and I will put that in the chat as well. And without any further ado, I'll hand it over to Jen. Hi, all. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and thank you to uh, the Roger Tory Peterson Institute for really making this project happen in so many ways, um, including today's conversation. So I want to start today by just defining what a spark bird is. Uh, we know that sort of in the birding community, we have this language that a spark bird is the bird or birds or maybe just the experience that hooks us into birding. So that's what our conversation is going to be around today. And to do that, I'm going to start by sharing the story of how the spark bird project came to be. because. I um I don't really have a spark bird. I have people. Um, I came to the birding community through my children who are passionate um, about nature. They have been from an early age through experiences that we've had in our local community, um, through nature education opportunities that they have had with their school. Um, and that really brought our family deeply connected to nature. I grew up hiking the Appalachian Trail, recycling. Um, no one saw them about birds, but it wasn't a central part of who I was until my children uh, led me to that and led our family to that. Um, particularly my daughter, Maisie, got uh, very interested in birds at a very young age. She is now 10 every year on her birthday because, or both my kids' birthdays, because I am who I am. I ask them some questions and we do a little survey. And um, we one of the questions that we ask is, what do you want to be when you grow up? And when she was five, she started saying that she wanted to be an ornithologist. When she was four, that was just scientists, sort of undefined. It's important to note that at age three, she wanted to be a dolphin. Uh, <laughs> So she, um, at age five, she, uh, somewhere between four and five, really fell in love with birds and discovered birds through a project that my son was doing in um, his second grade class. And we had the wonderful opportunity to be mentored by some amazing people, um, particularly Sarah Morris is a colleague here um, at Canisius. She's our vice president for academic affairs. She's a professor in the biology department. Um, she is past president of the Wilson Ornithological Society and incoming president for the American Ornithological Society. She studies songbird migration um, and the vocalizations of birds as they migrate. And she gave us a whole list of 
you need to do this and you need to do this and you need to do this. And she got us opportunities to go bird banding and seeing birds in the wild and having all of these incredible experiences um, as, as a family. And one of the things that she said you absolutely have to do as soon as Maisie turns eight is go to Hog Island Audubon Camp, which is this wonderful place off the coast of Maine if you can um, go. It's, it's incredible. And um, we spent this week learning together with all of these amazing naturalists, families, being around puffins and uh, the beautiful nature of, of Maine. And while we were standing in, I don't know, waiting for a boat or waiting for a meal, the uh, I noticed the camp director had these really nice uh, tattoos. And so I asked Eva, I said, no, you know, I, I really like your tattoos. Um, you know, what, what are they? I don't know what these birds were. And uh, she said, oh, those are my spark birds. And I said, what's a spark bird? And she told me, she defined spark bird for me, um, just as I did for y'all at the start of this. And I said, oh, you know about spark birds? I've heard a spark bird story. I had heard Peterson's story, um, that iconic story um, of the flicker. And I heard that visiting the Roger Tory Peterson Institute with my kids because they love connecting birds um, with their art. And that's so much of how they experience the natural world is, is through art. And so we had gone down there and we had heard the story um, of, of Peterson and his flicker. And I, like, I know that. I know, I know what a spark bird story is. And then I started thinking about my own research. And throughout my career, um, about 20, a little over 20 years now, I've been studying the stories that people tell about their lives that define who they are. And I came to that through a lifelong love of story um, and of understanding who people are and how they come to be who they are, um, where their passions are, where their interests are how that can benefit us throughout the lifespan, how um, for some people, their passions are a defining part of their identities and um, in their daily activities. And I started thinking, huh, I wonder if anybody's studying spark bird stories. And so I went, you know, and I got to Google and I, I didn't find, didn't find much, but I found some you know, great archives of spark bird stories. Um, shortly after the, uh, uh, this American life did a podcast, uh, then it was, it was in a Bob's Burgers episode recently. Right. Um, so, you know, there's this, uh, public narrative and public discourse around, um, spark birds. And so I had been looking for a while for a way for my academic work to give back to this community that has been such a core part of my, my life and my family's life and our joy and um, our passions. And that's where the Spark Bird Project came to be, um, collecting those stories and asking questions about those stories. And we'll go through, through some of these questions today and we'll talk about those. Um, as a scientist, one of my personal um, priorities is open sharing of data science and of our research findings, um, giving back to the community that science is not something to be hoarded, um, but is something that is a very communal. Um, and I think the, the birding community does such a great job of that with their community science work. Um, and that is what we're trying to create here is a community science project that understands um, birders themselves, because it's a piece of the ecology of birds that we just don't have. We have masses of evidence um, on birds, and we're we're constantly building and accruing more, um, but we don't know as much about birds. And so, what we're trying to do is build that data and then give that back to our community partners so that they can use it to inform the work that they are doing, um, because. What we know is that there are a lot of birders out there, right? So in uh, 2016, U.S. Fish and Wildlife estimated that 18% of the population, and of course, aged 18 and older, you know, we don't get to talk about the kid birds, um, were, were birders. And uh, when we look at that in parallel to the usage of 
tools like eBird to help with the community science of birding, we are seeing exponential growth in people who are engaging in birding in our society. And we know, you know so much about that. We're hearing about that um, from, from the pandemic that we had these opportunities to be out and go birding. And so we see huge growth. We see huge growth in the technology. We talk about the revolution of the Peterson Field Guide being introduced um, almost uh, 90 years ago next year. Um, and we see the revolution um, in the 70s that really brought more, um, more community participation in birding and broader access to birding. Um, and we're seeing that again now with technology. And so I think we're at a really prime time to start to ask these questions, understand these questions, and engage this community in understanding why and the benefits and opportunities. Um, some people care about the money. So, you know, if it seems important to you because this is a big, a big money industry, um, people spend money you know, traveling and on gear, um, uh, bird feeders uh, annually. That's, that's great. Um, for me, more importantly, just as we are seeing um, increases in our birders, we're seeing a great decline in our bird population. And each of you speak to that in your artwork um, in such a compelling way. Um, and so much of that decline is due to human causes. Right? Um, but we have tools to help mitigate our impact, right? I just got to hear um, a wonderful talk by uh, Dr. Kyle Horton, um, one of the originators of BirdCast. We know that tonight is going to be peak migration in so much of the Midwest. Um, this is a part of the Lights Out initiative, um, but we can see the data is clear. What my kids say is cats in, lights out uh, as part of their, their real advocacy work. And that's where we have a real opportunity here in understanding the ecology of birders and understanding how we can create more birders, how we can make birding more open and accessible to others through the stories from the Spark Bird Project, we can have an impact on the conservation efforts of our birding community and so have an impact on the lives of these birds. And I think this is summarized so well um, by a quote from Caitlin that is in um, her bio uh, hanging up at the Peterson Institute. Um, I spend a lot of time observing birds and plants and the more I have learned their names, the more I have begun to care about the state of their futures. Um, and I think that that captures it so well and leads so well into the stories that I'm going to ask you all to share. So this is the prompt uh, that all of our participants see when they engage in the Sparkbird Project. Uh, the idea is to share the story of how you got hooked into birding. Um, and that is in your words. There is no script. There is no. We have we have the iconic story um, of of Peterson in our minds, right? We can often get sort of captured um, by having those iconic moments, and some birders do, um, but others, it's more the people, um, or it's a series of experiences, or we started and then we came back to it. Um, so really, uh, share the story in in your words and in the way that means the most to you. And I think we're going to start with uh, Jenna Lynn. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my spark bird is a black pole warbler. And I actually knew the science behind this bird before seeing it a little bit. So um, I saw a black pole warbler about three years ago. And I knew very little to nothing about specific warblers um, at that point. I found out through eBird that there was um, a birding hotspot, which is one of the prime areas that birds um, kind of congregate on their migrational path up north and then back south again um, each year. So I found out that there was one like 40 minutes from my house and I said, well, I, I need to go. And I really didn't know much about birds, but I had done a small painting series about um, migration and learned that the black pole warbler was the one that created or spent the longest 
um, migrational journey of any songbird in North America. So they're wintering in South America and going all the way up to like the tippy top of the boreal forest in Canada. And they fly directly over the Gulf of Mexico. So 1800 miles in a single night. Um, so I thought that that bird sounded pretty cool. And um, I went to Wapanaka, which is the National Wildlife Refuge. And I saw it and I just couldn't believe it. Like, I think when you see a bird in person, it's just so small. It just seems impossible that this bird could accomplish that. And um, as I was looking at it, I was like, well, maybe that's um, a chickadee because they're very similar coloration. I'm like, it couldn't be, I just couldn't believe it. I, was, I, I confirmed no, um, it's a black pole warbler. So I think it sparked in me to a, a real need to share the real stories of birds and work for the rest of my life to make sure that um, that right for a spark bird moment exists for other people. So prior to the black pole, I think my art could have taken a lot of different directions, um, but it really focused me on the work of conservation and on preserving kind of the magic of the world around me. So I think before that I had been painting the idea of birds and birds is just like a general metaphor. Um, and I realized that this kind of did violence to these individual species that were so important um, to tell the actual story. So it's not that birds in general are important, you know, as long as there's some birds, you know, it's okay. For me, it really sparked in me this idea that um, each species is so incredibly important, has these amazing individual you know, lives and experiences. Thank you. That's such a beautiful story. <laughs> um, Caitlin. So my spark bird is a common loon, but I think before that, even like when I was younger and stuff like that, um, my family would take me to a lot of nature preserves. I remember going to Rhinestein and um, I remember them teaching us how to identify a chickadee by its call. And I remember my grandpa and my uncle, they always told me, um, who cooks for you is what a barred owl says and stuff like that. But um, I had this memory game of animals in North America when I was like, maybe like six. And I remember one of them was a common loon. And I was like, I just, I want to see this bird. And so when I was about 12, um, my family started going to the Adirondacks and there's loons like everywhere there. And so um, hearing one for the first time was really special for me, not just seeing it, but I learned how to call to them and then but I kind of just associated them with when I was in the Adirondacks I'd see loons when I was home I wouldn't I didn't have any uh concept of migration and so in April 2018 I think it was there was kind of this big um fallout of common loons I think because of a weather system that was happening and in my tiny little neighborhood pond eight common loons came down on it and I remember I was just I was walking home from school and I saw them there and I couldn't believe that there were loons like in my backyard. And so that was kind of when I like reached out to someone in the um, Buffalo Ornithological Society and they were like, yeah, there's like loons coming down all over the place. Um, and I kind of looked more into why they were here at this time of year. And I didn't even know um, that loons were something that migrated through our area. And so after that, I kind of started getting into birding. I realized there were other people that also were into birding like me because I kind of thought I was alone in this um and it kind of opened me up to seeing how many species of birds you can see just around in your own area um I right now I'm at college and I've seen over half the birds I've seen in this county I've been able to see just on my like college campus and I think that is something I like to incorporate in my art is showing people that there's cool birds you can see anywhere you are you don't have to travel to see them Thank you so much, Caitlin. Liz. Um, so my spark bird is a great horned owl. Um, I actually, uh, it's a captive owl that I saw not one in the wild, but um, when I was in college, um, I started out as a pre-vet student. And so I was looking for some hands-on experience um, with taking care of animals. Um, and I went to Cornell, so one of their uh, main um, attractions in the animal science department is the raptor program there. Um, I really had no interest in birds before joining, um, but then 
uh, going to the raptor barns and seeing a great horned owl so close, like his huge talons, it's really big yellow eyes. I was just like really intrigued by it. Um, and it kind of opened this world of uh, birding to me. Um, I joined the education presentation portion of the raptor program. And so learning about how, you know, seeing these birds when we go on outreach trips, uh, you know, really connected people to conservation concerns around them. Um, quickly, you know, all of my art became focused around birds. And so then I discovered uh, the career path of science illustration. Um, and so just, you know, seeking opportunities to see these birds for my own reference in my art, um, and then learning about, you know, different conservation concerns and diving into the world of ornithology and wildlife conservation. Um, I just kind of really owe to that experience with being that close to different raptors. Thank you so much, Liz. I love how each of your stories, um, you know, it's such different birds, right? Such different birds. But um, there's that common thread of finding a meaning, finding purpose. Uh, Jenna, when you said, you know, your art could have been sort of on anything, but then that moment created, you know, this, this clear path. And I think that's really one of the common threads that we see with our Sparkbird stories so far. Um, anybody else in the room, if you want to drop your, you know, the bird itself or, you know, a little description of your experience, please, please do drop that um, in the chat. Um, I think the common, one of the common threads is uh, those, the moments are transformative in some way, right? That um, we've been down one path and now suddenly we're seeing the world differently and we want to make an impact and we want to make a difference for these beautiful creatures who are living in the same space as us um, and I think that's one of the I, I read every spark bird story that comes in I get um, the the back end of the system sort of automatically sends me uh, it in an email, and I'm so excited whenever it comes in. Uh, I was at the science museum with my kids the other night, and one came in. And I was like, oh, I get to read one, um, and that's uh, that's I think the most common thread that we see um, in in the stories. Um, now, one of the questions that uh, we you know, are sort of most, people seem most curious about um, when I talk about the Spark Bird Project. It's like, well, what's the most common bird? Right? Um, and I am personally most interested, uh, one of the questions I'm most interested in is when, when do these happen? I'm, I'm a developmental psychologist. And so uh, I really want to know, you know, are these like things like my daughter, uh, my daughter's Spark Bird story is uh, I started at age zero. I don't remember a time when I didn't love birds. Um, and uh, we joke that, you know, she has this like stuffed um, blue footed booby. I've got a picture of him back there. Uh, that uh, was her lovey and maybe it was the giant inflatable turkey in the neighbor's yard uh, that she loved uh, but that, that they've always been part of her life um, whereas we have other folks who who came to it later in life um, and so looking looking at those um, and then these themes so um, the uh, the first piece uh, of sort of the reveal for this talk from our early narratives of spark bird experiences is the most common spark bird um, and the most common spark bird is the, the kingfisher. And I think um, this, and so we have, uh, this is Peterson's kingfisher over here. And then my daughter did uh, a very chunky one. Um, and uh, when I was telling her this and I ran the numbers the other day, but it's really interesting because they're um, really the theme of the most common spark bird is that um, there isn't consistency. It's not... It's not one bird that's really capturing people. It's the, the bird and the moment and the experience. Um, and that seems to be far more important than the specific bird itself. Um, although I have a theory for the, the kingfisher. Uh, I think this is probably informed by my own experience. Um, 
This is uh, the Nantahala River in the mountains of North Carolina. I was so busy paying attention to this beautiful, colorful, noisy bird who was flying along at the edge of the river that I fell out of my uh, ducky kayak shortly before this uh, this rapid. Um, but fortunately, my mother-in-law does uh, whitewater rescue and uh, got me out. So there are these big, flashy, bold birds, but they're birds that we... Um, that for a lot of folks who are starting their birding journey, you know, they're not a backyard bird. And they're not some, they're not a cardinal, they're not a blue jay, they're not the bird you might have learned about in your like second grade New York State module on birding. And so you're out there and um, you know, maybe you you just got a pair of binoculars, or you're just sort of wandering around enjoying a, a beautiful space. Then all of a sudden, here's this, you know good sized bird making crazy noises who is stunningly beautiful. And so you can see how that can, can capture people and can bring, bring people in. And so it's those, um, those sort of surprise moments. Another piece that seemed to be common in some of those Kingfisher stories was, and then I went back to my field guide because I wasn't quite sure what it was. And I found it and I had confidence that I was right. And so I felt like I was a real birder because I could see this thing that I didn't know. And then I knew it. And that piece of sort of moving from, um, moving into, into a state of knowing, right? Knowing the thing, being able to identify the thing um, and, and having confidence in being able to do that again, I think is another really compelling piece that we're starting to see come out of, um, of these stories. Um, the age range is broad um, and variable, and I love that. Uh, we have people birding, starting birding throughout their lives. Um, and I think that's a really key piece um, as we think about uh, one of the primary components of this project is the inclusivity of birding. Um, the average birder from US Fish and Wildlife data that we looked at back at the beginning, um, is a mid fifties white male. Um, National Audubon Society, uh, the most common membership is a 60 something white woman. Um, and we see um, there are wonderful efforts um, from young birder clubs around the country um, and the American Birding Association, Cornell Lab of Ornithology and National Audubon doing so much to support bringing um, young birders in, um, but there are a lot of spaces where young birders don't feel welcome um, and don't feel that, that birding is for them. And so we can do work there. We can also do work um, later in life. And um, the a friend from Hog Island Audubon Camp who works with older adults and helping them see birds and the impact of that on their cognitive health. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities, right? Um, at, at our age ranges, um, as well as keeping um, our, our young adults engaged and passionate in birding or bringing that to them, right? That's when um, some of your experiences are, and that's a really uh, important time from a developmental perspective for becoming who we are and, and understanding who we are. The thing that I love best in these stories is that so many of them contain someone else an interpersonal connection. Caitlin, you said um, finding that there are other people like me. Oh my goodness, that connection to the birding community, being with others. Um, I, I came across a research study a few years back that was about boringness. And uh, people who take online surveys for fun and money um, actually said that birding was was a boring thing um and it's like okay this is a selection this is, these are not birders um and that it was a very solitary thing and so often yes it can be a very solitary a very meditative a very personal uh thing but it can also be a very social thing we volunteer um at a bird banding station uh at braddock bay outside of rochester and oh my goodness we did the whole time. Um, and so there's there's a, a very strong social aspect to birding. And there's a lot of intergenerational connections, this wonderful experience with my grandfather um, 
when uh, you know I saw my first owl, those sorts of moments um, are, are really common. And the other sort of key pieces are some of the tools and the resources, our field guides. Um, and I love that, uh, that, you know, here, uh, one of our, our first partners with the Sparkbird Project is, is Peterson and the legacy that Peterson has left um, with field guides, with people who do, haven't seen birds. Um, our our uh, ornithologist, Sarah Morris, on the project, her story is that she, her dad got a field guide. She was seven and she was looking through it and that was really great. And so then she got taken to this and this and this. Um, and so, uh, and I think a, a really key piece of that, right, is the art, um, the art and the beauty of what um, Peterson captured in field guides that now we see and other field guides and the visualization. And I think that's a lot of what y'all are doing um, with, with your art. And so making sure that people have access to those um, and access to uh, uh, the other Things that hook us into birding, the ability to travel, um, the ability to uh, afford a pair of binoculars, and those sorts of pieces are going to be really critical um, for, for moving forward with how we create more opportunities. So that's where I want to turn the conversation to y'all, um, is um, what, what do you see for you as the benefits of birding, because it's one of the pieces that we really see is this interpersonal connection is great, um, feeling connected to nature, um, we have some stories of, of grief, of moving through grief and birds really helping with that. Um, there's a, a sort of a common pattern in broader stories um, of narrative identity and transformative experiences of moving from sort of a dark place to um, a more positive place. And we see in these stories, uh, birds often help people, people come to that space. Um, so what are some of the benefits that you've experienced in birding um, and what are the barriers and opportunities uh, that we have in the birding community? Um, and since we uh, went alphabetically by, last, uh, by first name last time, uh, let's switch it up um, and we'll start with you, Liz. Um, yeah, I think, you know, birding really does help uh, these days a lot with kind of, you know, not just feeling connected to nature, but kind of, like you said, like a meditative experience, um, you know, an opportunity to kind of immerse yourself in nature and really look at what's around you. Um, as far as barriers, I think it's, it can sometimes you know, really depend on what kind of community you live in. Um, if there's access to, you know, walkable areas or public parks, um, you know, just the environment you're in in general, you know, if it's safe to walk around, things like that, you know, uh, binoculars can be, you know, a major hurdle too, but there's so many birds, you know, if you are able to get near a feeder, you can start there. And so I think there's a lot of great opportunities to just, uh, you know, jump into birding at various stages. It can seem really um, um, exclusive kind of when you get to, you know, like competitive birders or people who travel the world to try and see every bird they can, but birding can be a very small and intimate thing or a very large and social thing. So um, I think it definitely can add a positive to your life in any way, but yeah. That's sort of my thoughts on that. Caitlin, how about you? Um, I think birding in general has just definitely gotten me out of my comfort zone. I am very like quiet and typically reserved, but it's it's introduced me to like a broad range of people across all age ranges. And um I don't know, like when I'm birding, it's kind of I can be solitary and focus on what I'm doing and experiencing nature by myself but I also sometimes lead field trips and I enjoy birding with large groups of people and helping people identify birds they may not like know yet and I guess trying to find like a spark bird experience for someone else I I've gotten basically my entire family into birding they were not into it before but over time they've kind of started like um becoming more interested and that's been really rewarding to see um also I mean, I, like two years ago, I found myself like in the middle of the ocean on a boat looking for birds. I never would have done that if I hadn't been into birding. Um, 
for barriers and opportunities, I think, I mean, as a young Britter, a lot of people are older and sometimes they are, they kind of look down on younger Britters as less knowledgeable or um, they sometimes think they're right. And I don't want to like tell them they're wrong or something. I feel like it's not my place to, even though I might know more about a specific bird. But in general, I think the birding community around in Western New York has been very friendly and open. Right on, how about you? Um, I wanna ditto everything that has been said so far. And um, I think, you know, there's a lot of, when I said like the spiritual, you know, psychological and like our mental well-being, this attachment to the natural world, for me, I'm always struck with like, this is happening with or without me. And it's just a very humbling part to reconnect me to this idea of like me as part of this cosmos of, you know, time going forward, like, you know, not to be all artsy, um, but I think there's just so much you can get from a psychological standpoint with birding. And I would say um, some of the barriers, you know, people talked about this, but this like consumerism attitude, um, even I'm not uh, personally, you know, I'm kind of leery of the, uh, like I've seen all 10,000 whatever species of birds, like this is my, you know, goal, because even that can be, I think, counter to what birds need and what we need um, as people. And uh, I think I'd add as far as a opportunity for um, inclusion, I'm a certified interpreter for the deaf. And um, I was out birding yesterday and it just struck me using the Merlin app that, you know, there's this access to sound that you have um, as a deaf individual that you would not have had five or 10 years ago. And I think that's just really cool. Like um, embracing the technology is one of the benefits I think we have uh, at our disposal now. Thank you all so much. I think it's it's such an exciting time um, with with technology, but also with the number of people who care um, and who want to make a difference and want to make an impact. And you know, talking with folks who have expertise in so many different areas, um, being able to help shape, um, hopefully turning that that decline of birds around to look a lot more like the um, the growth in, in birders. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that I think about a lot is we, we want pe we want to create those spark bird moments for people, right? Um, and Caitlin, you know, I, I had the smile in your story of, you know, you've gotten like your whole family involved because we're totally the same way. Like none of us, we, we, <laughs> We joked that like we didn't even know we had this like family of owls living in our backyard when we lived in Dallas, Texas, and like no clue. And I look at that map of the Midwest um, and how bright it's going to be tonight. And I think about my time in graduate school and my postdoc when I just didn't know all of these amazing birds around me and I didn't even know it. Um, and so, you know, having that one person who can pull us in, who can create those connections and create those new opportunities. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's it's not enough to just show someone that there are birds there. It's not enough to show someone just how to use Merlin or how to use eBird. We need to have those conversations about birding ethics um, and about um, being safe while we're birding. I had a conversation with someone the other day who said, I, I had never thought about being safe. I'm a middle-aged white guy and like I just go birding and it's like whoa <laughs> okay um, like I'm so glad that you heard somebody talk and that that shifted your perspective um, and you know we need to talk about how to um, how to be welcoming and how to be inclusive and how to think about um, different perspectives and different approaches and, and different ways that people experience the world, right? I, you know, gentlemen, I, I'm so excited about um, the different ways that we can sense and appreciate 
and birds um, in, in different in, in different modalities and um, you know the visualizations and spectrograms um, of, or the, the sonograms of birds uh, it's it's a, a new avenue and a new way for people to find passion in this and then that grows from there right once we love birds then we start to learn more about the environment that they're in um, and that has, or maybe we just stay with birds, but it still has benefit for the environment that they're in, right? And it has this trickle down effect um, to hopefully make um, make some some inroads um, in the conservation work that we need to do. Do y'all have any questions, um, or anybody um, from the Peterson Institute team want to share their uh, experiences of how they got brought into this? Brandy did share her story. I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you want to share? Yeah, so um, I will always remember the, I will always remember sitting in um, I think my like just environmental science course in middle school and learning about the birds of paradise. And I just could not believe how all of this diversity existed in this one region of the earth and how incredible these birds are and how different they look than anything that I see around here. Um, I can't remember what the name of the bird is now, but I vividly remember seeing the video of the little black bird with like a blue spot on its chest that fluffs up his feathers and he dances and he <laughs> shakes around the female. And I just fell in love with that little bird um, the moment I saw it. And from there I've had countless, you know, just enjoyable experiences birding. Um, even this morning I was out watching the bluebirds at RTPI and just immersed in the moment of watching the male and female bring little worms into their hatchlings. Um, it's just, yeah, it just invokes like this really like, just like awe-inspiring feeling, I guess, whenever I'm out and I see all these birds are here. It's always constant learning. Um, yeah, I'm really glad that I got into birding, like to the level that I did. Thank you so much, Brandy. So if I may, while other people, if you're formulating questions or, or wanna share, I just wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you. Good job, Dr. Jen Letty smith um, and all of our artists for sharing today. And Brandy, thank you for sharing. Um, it's so wonderful to hear from everyone and it just really um, helps to, to learn more about what inspires you um, and what inspires your work. So um, we're very excited to be part of this project. So. Um, I would also just like to let everyone know that our current exhibition, which features work by these three artists, as well as Bela Arrieta and Carmen Osterman, is on view until June 11th, so please come visit. Um, and also on view until June 11th is an exhibition of paintings by Alex Warnick, our inaugural resident artist, entitled The Art of Observation. So also um, on Monday, May 15th from 12 to 1 Eastern, Bela Arrieta will present a virtual talk in which she'll discuss the intersection of art and science in her practice. And that talk is free to all, and you can sign up through our website, and I will put that in the chat. Um, so now I'll let everyone ask their questions. We don't have any other questions. Um, to uh, remind folks, this is a community science project, and anyone can share their story at uh, www. Uh, spark-bird.org. Um, and uh, when you go to that website, you'll see uh, a brief opening survey that asks for your Sparkbird story itself um, and a few additional questions. And then you get to um, a nice survey queue that you can come and go as you please um, in sharing additional stories that you might want to share, you know, a favorite birding moment uh, that happened uh, well past your Sparkbird time. Um, as well as some uh, standard surveys uh, about the uh, your your own personal experiences um, and uh, who you are. Um, we also have paper copies that are available if you don't want to do the internet version, and uh, those are available to be picked up at uh, the Peterson Institute. So you can go by um, and see the exhibit and get a paper copy 
that you can then return uh, to the team there and we'll uh, get that back to me. Um, in closing, I want to make sure to thank my team, um, Dr. Sarah Morris, the ornithologist uh, consult for the team. Uh, Genevieve Fontana designed our logo and has been um, wonderful in helping me understand and learn um, social media, which I'm not great at. Um, my other social media consultant um, is my uh, good friend, writer and poet Janet McNally, um, who helps me navigate how to use technology uh, to share um, and uh, any errors in Instagram are my own and not hers. <laughs> also a great thanks to my family who um, are of course the spark for getting into birding and maintaining that passion uh, and a particular uh, appreciation to uh, the partners who I'm sharing the work back with um, and particularly to the Roger Tory Peterson Institute. Uh, I shared this project as an idea uh, with Arthur Pearson, uh, the CEO of RTPI, um, shortly after I had it. And he's really been such a, a great supporter and motivator in encouraging uh, this project to move forward and helping make connections to other organizations and provide opportunities. So um, I think most of all, you know, appreciation to Peterson for having that Sparkbird moment uh, that has catalyzed uh, really a generation of birders and our experiences. And I'm so excited to see what uh, the world holds for the next 90 years for our birds. Thank you all so much for being part of our conversation today. We do have one question in the chat. And um, it's for all the artists. Could each of you wrap up the call today to and speak on how your art sparks a passion for birds and the natural world? Caitlin, do you want to start us off since you haven't gotten to start an answer yet? Yeah, sure. Um... Uh, so I guess my art in the exhibition specifically, um, when I was doing that project with the birds and the leaves, I tried to pick birds that were kind of pretty common ones that most people would recognize like in their yard or around their area if they live in this area. Um, and also how those birds can connect to plants, because for me, birding then got me into starting to identify native plants and how we can sort of like grow native plant gardens and stuff like that to help um, increase bird habitat in the area and stuff like that. I'm so ready for this question. Um, I would say I've met a lot of people that that's like, it's, and I'm sure there's a psychological study here, but it's so innate to us as humans. And, you know, we talk about escaping to the natural world. And I would say it's impossible to escape from the natural world. Um, and I think birds are this very non-threatening way that people really just naturally identify with that helps them realize that, you know, the fate of this little bird's life and the fate of plants and the fate of trees and grizzly, like they're all intertwined with my own existence and my life. And um, I think art is also um, very much like birds as, as far as it's a non-threatening way that you can introduce some of these heavy ideas about you know, global warming, our need to preserve species um, that otherwise people would probably um, you know, have a barrier to listening to, but are automatically softened towards when they feel like they're discovering it through your work. And Liz? Um, well, specifically, um, most of the work I have in the exhibition um, is from pieces I did for the World of Birds um, project. So uh, I was illustrating very recently discovered species. Uh, so I tried to illustrate them in a way which is, you know, a little more detailed than the typical field guide illustration, but still relies heavily on like the language of the visual language a field guide uses. So uh, trying to present these birds uh, in an easily digestible way to the viewer, um, also including 
you know, a map to see where they're located and when they've been discovered um, and just leaving enough that the viewer can, you know, become curious about the specific species there and maybe look more into it. Um, I'd say most of my work in general tries to spark a curiosity or show a bird in a new light you maybe you haven't considered before. So it's just my hope that with everything I illustrate, you know, it gets the viewer interested in, you know, that species and then maybe they can discover the specific conservation concerns around it. Thank you so much, Liz. All right, well, um, unless there are any other questions, um, that was wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you, Jen. And um, everyone go to the Spark Bird Project and tell her your story. Um, enjoy the rest of your day.